Okay, ladies and gents, we might get started if that's okay. So today we have uh, James Seymour from uh, C4Net. I'll do a quick introduction of James uh, very, very shortly. Before I do, uh, as we always do, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Uh, this is part of our uh, VCTF uh, seminar series. We, we've had uh, several of those over the past uh, 12 months. We've got several more coming up, as I understand it. Uh, so what we're talking about with, with this series uh, is just a new, uh, new energy technologies, and, uh, and James obviously fits in very nicely with that. So as I said, he is the uh, CEO of the Centre for New Energy Technologies, uh, known as uh, C4Net. It's a Victorian government initiative uh, that, that brings together researchers, policymakers, and industry to advance uh, energy innovation in Victoria. He's uh, previously held a number of uh, senior positions uh, in, uh, in the energy sector, both at Germana and at Origin. Uh, primarily focused on renewable energy and new te uh, energy technology. So James is going to talk for about uh, 35, 45 minutes and we'll have some uh, time for some questions. So big welcome to James. Thank you. Um, thank you. And I'm really happy to keep this very conversational and, and uh, happy to take questions on the way through if people want. If I feel like we're, we're getting bogged down or whatever, I'll, I'll move it on just so we get through in the time. Um, but uh, please feel free to ask questions as we go through. Um, so Centre for New Energy Technologies was set up, um, it was actually just over a year ago. And I came in at the end of January and started operationalising it. So it's been in development for, for a while at, at Victorian government level but it's actually now independent of government. So while we're very generously supported by them, uh, we actually operate as an independent company. And the idea of that was to just free us up a little bit more to do some of the, um, the work across the sector and because without pushing any particular part of the sector. We do tend to focus in from the distribution side through to consumers. So while there's lots and lots of developments going on in wind, in large scale solar and everything. We tend, we, there are others who are doing a lot of work in that space. Where we tend to focus in is particularly the opportunity around AMI data. And obviously Victoria is a great base uh, for that, although growing around Australia and that opens up uh, opportunities. Um, but also there's the expansion of DER and everything within uh, around Australia. Um, the impact that that has on two networks, the opportunities it develops, it presents to networks, to retailers and to consumers and startups is where we really tend to focus in. And we do look at the, um, the skills side and then some of the policy uh, sides as well. We're only a very small centre, but we're very generously supported by, uh, for one, the Victorian government, but two um, university members, including um, University of Melbourne and um, Monash University, who are members of the, the centre. I think uh, we've got Deakin Federation, RMIT um, and Swinburne as, as well. Um, and then uh, City, Corp, uh, City Power, Power Corp, uh, United and Osnet Services uh, from the distributors. And we have AEMO supporting our board um, as well. And then we have some uh, board members, uh, independent board members as well. So what I thought I'd just take through is a couple of the mega trends that are acting on our, our industry. So not by any one particular participant or anything, but just acting more broadly across. And I think in the room, we're probably fairly familiar with those. So I won't spend too long uh, on them. And then what I was gonna do was bring out some of the, the just the global cases in point, um, just really to spur the, the conversation and some challenges, then how that's being applied locally as well. and it's all great to have these solutions and everything, but there's actually some real challenges that get thrown up as well. So that's why I thought I'd cover off um, some practical barriers. So first of all, the trends that are impacting. I mean, as I mentioned, from a C4Net perspective, when we're looking from that distribution down to the consumer or behind the meter, um, we're, we're particularly then, um, we see the, the decreasing cost of technology. So the, the impacts is driving, you know, batteries, obviously the, the uptake of batteries, what we've seen happen in solar over the many years, um, it's gonna happen with batteries again. Where of the, of the view, it's just complete saturation with batteries and solar and, and EVs um, as we go through, it's, it's really just a matter of when and, and the impacts that it that has on that. 
Um, combined with big data and information uh, and ICT um, uh, methodologies where you can access data. I mean, everybody has their mobile phone, everyone has their apps that they can go and access all these elements on. But likewise, if you think right back through into the distribution system, the, the sheer volumes of data around trying to manage very large networks and through to retailers and how they can connect to people and everything. So data sort of underpins all those, um, all those areas. I think a really big trend that is impacting the industry, and, and this is reasonably global, we see it, it's, it, it presents itself in different ways around the world. Um, in Australia in particular around the, the, the uh, consumer preferences and what's there. And, and a bit of that's a bit of a lack of trust with the energy companies and energy companies have often not served themselves um, particularly well there. And you can see the efforts that they're trying to make to be closer to their, to their customers, both distributors, retailers and startups. Um, and that's part of the opportunity for, for new startups and everything as well. But at, at the heart, the consumers often like to either take control um, and, and make individual decisions or be more active in, in their element. And that could be for cost, it could be for sustainability, it could be whatever. It's just a far more active than if, if we think back to how passive it's been in the past. And obviously we've got um, the regulatory drivers and, and policy drivers. So the move towards um, a greener, more sustainable um, uh, grid. I think back, um, I, I joined the solar industry in the early 2000s and did a lot of work in Germany um, at the time. And to see how a country really led um, the global uh, uptake of solar with their million roof uh, program at the time, but very, very sound policy. And, and to see other countries try to emulate it where they had a, a, a staggered feed-in tariff that came off over many years and tried to keep a control on the effectively the growth there were many other countries that tried to emulate it, but never actually copied what Germany did. And I couldn't understand why, because Germany actually had the most sound policy and the most stable um, uh, policy that was there. And, and everywhere where people um, stepped off that path, that's where the big costs came in or the big uh, discrepancies came in. It's really relevant for Australia right now, because actually we're arguably leading the world or in forecast to lead the world in DER. And that's through a combination of factors of the, the, the cost of electricity here um, and, and the, some of the consumer preferences and everything that are there. But Australia is for, forecast to be a real leader in the, um, in the DER space. And so those policy settings and everything and trying to learn from what we've seen before, there's a lot of opportunity there uh, for us. But it also means that some of them, the, the, the rules won't be written. We can't look elsewhere. We're going to be making that we will be writing the playbook and there's other areas uh, looking to us, especially you'll see this in, in batteries. Um, there's also going to be a whole lot of externalities that are exposed, uh, in, imposed on us that we won't have any uh, control over. When the global car manufacturing um, uh, uh, cohort, if you like, shift to electric uh, uh, trains, they're not going to build special cars for Australia that are, uh, you know, uh, combustion engine. So that will be a taker of that type of technology and that whether we're ready for it or not really is up to us and how much we plan. But there also, of course, we try to look for parallels around the world as well, where there are learning opportunities, where there are um, other challenges. And we, we, you've seen certainly the debate in Victoria around the, the cost of Amy meters and the, the rollout, the smart meters, and have they been beneficial and everything. And um, th there's been other areas around the world that have had challenges with that as well and trying to assess that. And yet you've got other areas that look upon us with envy as to the, the pool of data and everything that we do have and what we can do um, here in Victoria because of the, the investments that have been made in the past. So I'll touch on a couple of global cases in point. Um, but really thinking through, you, you, this is now trying to think of the the innovations that are coming through largely underpinned by data and data use. And so if we think through, it, it's changing the way we measure our networks, measure our retail opportunities and measure how it's uh, provided to consumers. There's new tools, new devices that are available, um, new opportunities, um, new skills that are needed and new challenges that are presented. Um, but it's also, there's quite a dynamic going on of rechallenging some of the what's the community versus what's the individual benefit 
and, and how should they be, be framed up. Certainly, if I look at, um, so come back to now distributors and how they're looking at themselves. Um, Singapore Power recently published a, a new benchmarking uh, uh, approach uh, for distributors. But what I thought was quite interesting about this was that four of the areas really, uh, so data analytics, DR integration, green energy, and customer empowerment and satisfaction. 10 years ago, these did not even register on there at all as to how they would actually um, measure themselves. Um, and yet that's how, you know, there's, this is a global index that is used. And it's more about what are the factors that they're looking at to see as, as important. If I look, um, this example is actually a, a, um, a Swiss company called Tico, which came out of the telecommunications uh, industry. But here we see totally different devices and tools that are gonna be used um, and, and there's, this is not saying Tico is better than anybody else. There's a, there's a whole lot I've just put out as a, an example because um, there's lots of other companies that do this as well. But if we think of how that company is made up and what is it their service offering that's out there to customers, it's very much based on devices that are in the home, gateways that are monitoring energy use, um, utilising then clever analytics that are on there to either predict uh, use or, or um, how it can respond to the grid. Um, and financial tools that sit there for trading, um, VPPs, et cetera, that can be there. Um, it's also, they now insert themselves, of course, between the customer and the distributor. And that was not something that happened before. So there's this new category of players um, in there. Um, I get very excited about EVs and the pro, uh, opportunities that it presents, but that's largely because I think of it as just batteries on wheels. And, and so when we've got this, we've now got for the first time, you think of even like take a transmission down to distribution, down to customer. And we've got this, we used to have this centralized generation and then out, we've now got some distributed generation out with solar and everything. But we've now got movable generation and storage that we can shift around. Some of that movement we can control, incentivize um, or, or uh, promote, um, but others, it, we, we, there's gonna be a natural movement and everything, which is why I use this sort of map of London of the, of the car movement. It, this is car density between 4 a.m. and 9 a.m. where everyone's moved into, um, into different spots. And of course, there's any, if you, I'd love to have the maps where I had the energy use across those zones at the same time. And of course, we're getting into the types of positions now where we have surplus energy at various times of day at a very low cost. And this opens up all sorts of opportunities that can, um, that can come through here. Importantly, we open up discretionary timing now. When do we charge? When do we discharge? When do we discharge back from the car back into the grid? Um, and everything which often sort of gets gets missed. There's the potential, some, it's interesting hearing the various players talk about it as well in the industry and it often is quite telling of their, their worldview. Um, it's seen as a problem for some people and, and what a challenge it is and seen as a huge opportunity for, for others and how it can be utilised and, and you know these are tool sets that we just haven't had at our, our hands before. They make things really complex but it also opens up a whole lot of solutions um, as well. Um, I, you know, it often gets cited around the, the Norway examples and everything of, of what's there, but because of the density of, of um, electric vehicles there, we do get some real insights into um, uh, charging behavior and everything. And what we, uh, what we see there is that, um, it, just to highlight this discretionary point, was that, Typically you only need two or three hours charging, but you've got an eight to 10 hour window in which it's, it's required. And so um, they're seeing, uh, something that was of interest to me was there was 97% of detached homeowners are, are charging at home, but a third of, a, uh, weekly, so daily or weekly, but a third of apartment dwellers aren't. So while they have the electric vehicle and they're living in, a, in an apartment, 
they are not charging at home. So you think then, okay, where are you charging? Um, and yet, actually, the use of public charges is not so high. So you're seeing workplace charging, um, at, for example, being very strong. I don't, yeah. Uh, what is the latest system on, the, like, for example, lead can, feedback can be mm. great, um, but on the battery um, usage and the cost per kilowatt hour um, for the lowering the battery cycles, what's the latest system on that? So, as in what's the, the cost of the battery that under... <laughs> yeah, so Ed, I'll, I will check the question then. <laughs> Is the question around the decreasing cost of batteries that underpin it or the, or the cost of charging the electric vehicle compared to petrol? Now, if you use the battery in an electric vehicle and uh, I don't know how many thousands of cycles you have before um, end of lifetime or something, if you constantly have them as charging, discharging and providing that service to the grid, what's the equivalent cost for the owner of the vehicle by depreciating his vehicle asset a bit quicker? Mm. It's uh, so the, the, the charge, you're saying by cycling the battery more frequently, what is the impact? I, I, I don't know. Um, but if you like, there's the, you could turn it around the other way and say, um, how do you assess that your vehicle could actually now be a money making machine as well by being in there? So it's a, it's a bit both ways there. The maximum benefit of using your vehicle to discharge onto the grid would be when you have those extremely high prices and very high demand on the grid, which, which might only happen, you know, the order of 10, 20 hours a year. So you're not really cycling the battery a whole lot more times to get, uh, if you've got say five gigawatts of batteries on the grid on EVs, and you can use that to avoid having five gigawatts of peak low, peak generation for those few hours a year when you have that maximum demand, that, that's a huge bonus for generation and the distribution network. So I think one of the, so while that is something to really think about, uh, there is the challenge then for market structure and market design. So for example, think here, so you, you're exactly right. The, the, you know, for certain hours of the day, at certain days of the year at those peak events you you have very very high pricing events and you know when going down to the five minute structure in australia will will impact that however i don't think anyone here in this room can access that pricing retailers can retailers can anyone exposed to the wholesale market can and so that right gives rise to um aggregators uh, potentially aggregators um but even with aggregators, there's quite a cost to play there and the ability to access those markets. So then how do you send the signal to enable, to, to get the behavior um, that you actually want? And that's what, it, it's, people are grappling with this all around uh, the world. It's one of the challenges that actually sits here at the moment. State Grid of China, um, I raised because they're the world's largest uh, electricity customer, uh, electricity company. And to go and see their um, their control room, where they have the the what they call the Internet of Vehicles. It's Internet of everything that seems to come through, but Internet of Vehicles that they have, where they are monitoring um, the the electric networks matched with the transport movements that are moving around. The, it's just staggering the the amount of data and everything that underpins it. It's kind of scary how much is monitored and everything as well. And there might be some appealing things or challenging things there um, as well. But the, um, just the volume that is there, it, it's something to really um, uh, be aware of. And, and the, the growth rate uh, that is happening is quite staggering. We're also, so I took that as a really big market example, but if I go down to a smaller market and think of something like um, the market of Singapore, um, it's very small, but very, very dense uh, in terms of network and everything um, that sits there. And I, I spoke about the community and individual um, benefit before. For the first time you're seeing um, opportunities sort of exist here of um, community air conditioning. Uh, so not 
providing it any of the individual apartments, but actually across entire uh, blocks. And that can, uh, by utilizing the scale um, benefit that's there uh, with what they call district cooling, they've managed to take out about 50% of the, the cost of providing air conditioning. Uh, and even ridiculously to the point of providing outdoor air conditioning in some uh, areas around the Marina Sands uh, bit that they're trialling at the moment. But the, the point being that um, the, the large community infrastructure that can be there and then utilised by um, individuals within there, the, the, um, uh, what the, by utilising a different form of cooling, they've now shifted that to a discretionary basis as to when does it operate, um, effectively cooling overnight and then utilising it through the day. And, and this has been rolled out a couple of big developments now. Um, around. So Marina Sands, for example, has, I think it's five miles of piping underneath the ground that is just for the, the district cooling. Looking a bit more locally um, and um, one of the, uh, it, it, this is happening globally, but this is a, an Australian example that I've brought up. Um, the utilization of machine learning um, and in some ways artificial intelligence as well, but in particular machine learning on the, uh, on utilizing energy data and then trying to extract um, operational methodologies from that. It, I've just shown the, the number of papers that have cited um, uh, just as, as evidence of the, th this is not of machine learning, this is machine learning in the energy distribution um, space in particular. And getting on to, this is an, uh, I, I just took one example from an RMIT um, paper that was done, but just very, it, the advanced techniques, the, the machine learning obviously covers a huge range of, of approaches and everything but the potential to really have by far um, the best forecasting methodologies by utilizing machine learning is coming through. And you're seeing AEMO um, see this now. There's often, and also the distributors, forecasting is really, really, really important uh, for them. And you're seeing that um, they're, they're utilizing some different techniques. There's often a reluctance to let go of uh, the existing ways. And that's because you, you there's big consequences of getting it wrong. But what is becoming very, very clear is the potential for it to be far more accurate um, that's here. So, um, so the, the, this is, an, I, I've just shown the mean standard error on, on this, but from a particular study, which was just around a particular building and everything and, and predictability of the energy use um, that was there by utilizing very advanced techniques, it, it reduced it down to about a third, the, um, the mean square error. If we think of our local landscape and the players um, that are in it, um, a lot of the names here in the transmission distribution and retail area have been fairly, fairly uh, standard for a long time. We have seen news, um, uh, large scale generation uh, come in, but we've seen a huge growth in the, the, the opportunities down at the consumer and the behind the meter area. And that's, again, a lot of these have technology um, underpinning them. It's everything there from um, embedded networks through to service companies, disaggregation services that, that can look at energy data and show you what you're using or predict what you're going to be using and, and um, uh, the likes of aggregators. And, and that's by no way complete. That was just illustrative to, uh, again, give some examples of the types of companies that you're seeing come in um, into us. You also have, uh, uh, sorry, obviously as we go from one-way flow to two-way flow, the importance of orchestration um, across the grid becomes increasingly important. And you see um, AEMO uh, now looking at um, the utilization of data and, and saying, how do we build a digital twin uh, for the whole uh, network, uh, sorry, for the whole market? so that we can pressure test it and forecast um, as well. Now, th that's just in their, their stated plans for, for this year and everything, so it's not in place yet, um, but you can see where they're going uh, with it. There's some pretty novel use. This is actually a C4Net um, project, uh, but 
by the understanding of the last mile of, of our distribution systems is not, not particularly advanced. And that's because it's never needed to be. Um, when you start putting generation assets or, or um, batteries in at the, at, at the end of the grid, suddenly you do need to know about that last mile. And um, you can do that through a whole lot of monitoring um, and going and putting in more meters and everything through there, which obviously has a high degree of cost. Um, as to what needs to go in. Um, but what we are seeing now is that through the AMI network, there's actually uh, putting some machine learning onto the, and, and monitoring the, the network um, measurements that are within the AMI meters. So not so much the consumption data that each of us has, but the, the network measurements that are in there. Um, they can actually in, infer that connection, um, the behavior of DER, the behavior of the customer and what's happening at that localized area really, really well without any further infrastructure investment. Um, so it's a, it's a really interesting approach that's being pushed at the moment. So we have all these opportunities and everything that are around, but um, then, then come some challenges as well. And this is fairly superficial, uh, but just to illustrate the point that um, actually, the executives and everything of today's businesses and energy businesses or, or of the last 10 years, it's not necessarily the same skill sets that you're going to require as you go ahead in the next 10 years or so. And um, I, I just randomly went and picked a Australian retailer, a Australian network, and then picked a micro, an Australian microgrid um, operator as well. And, and you're seeing far more of the data analytics type approaches and skills that are coming through digital skills uh, that are acquired and these are needed in very senior um, uh, positions. Obviously they're very different size companies and everything, but it helps me illustrate the point uh, here. It's just data, right? Like it's just heaps and heaps and heaps of data. But what that um, means, it, the ability to take that data and turn it into useful information is a challenge. And it's those who have the skills and the knowledge of the industry to be able to do that and the various techniques um, that can be approached. And so we're seeing new, new skills um, uh, come in. We often hear at the center that, you know, oh, if only the data was available. And then we find, well, actually there's, there's, there's a lot of data available and, and out there, but maybe it's not in the right usable form or it's um, not been, uh, uh, understood or requested right for the right purpose. And I'll give a very simple illustration of that um, in a moment. But it does get complex reasonably quickly. And we, we have frequently people coming in with um, sort of VPP solutions or those types of uh, uh, ideas, but the market structure may not support those. Um, or it may not be that the incentives are right with the, um, are with the right individuals, as in the individual entities there, to enable these things to flow. Um, so just some very simple practical examples, but again, to, to illustrate. Um, you can build it, but will they use it? So um, uh, just even in the room here, how many people have looked at their energy data in the last month? So that is a very, very unusual <laughs> um, uh, so, and, and a very special audience. Oh, I, my hand's often the only one that goes up. <laughs> um, if you think, of, if you can think of your last um, interaction with your electricity retailer, did they utilize, did they look at your data usage? Did they make any comment about how you're using that, how you're using your electricity? There's a couple of hands. The question is that when I did ask them to provide me my data, they did ask me, why you are asking for this? And I said, because I want to have a look at it. And <clears throat> I said, because, Is it, is it on? Okay, so I did ask them I need my data because I want to optimize my usage to decide which days, which hours of the day I will do more things or less things. My goodness, and, what an annoying customer. And, 
do you know what they told me? The girl said, it doesn't really matter because uh, no matter what you'll do, at the end you'll pay the same. You pay the same. Why? Because they are twist having all the information about my usage. They are twisting different plans so that they will get always the same uh, money from me. So this is something which is very important and must be addressed mm -hmm. and properly changed. So this is what I was, it's a great point of what, if, what, there's no incentive for them to do it, right? There, there's no, in, so as we look at the, the time of use, uh, the opportunity with smart meters, we've all got the data availability, every one of us to go and have the time of use. Uptake of time of use, I, this might be a couple of years out of date, but it's, a, it's down around 5% in, in Victoria. And if you actually ring up your retailer and ask them, they'll often say, no, you're better off just staying where you are on a flat rate. So you've suddenly removed any incentive uh, from uh, as in when to utilize or, or not. And uh, if you come back to the battery type example, uh, sorry, the vehicle type uh, example before of the charging, if you're buying and selling, if, if, if it's if you, uh, no price uh, difference for you, there's no incentive to go and actually charge back at a peak event or something uh, while there. But, um, and, and, if you sort of underpin, you know, dig in quite a lot, actually that agent is probably not in any way incentivized to get you the best service or information or anything like that. They're about, have they retained you as a customer within seven minutes? It's their allocation to, you know, serve you and move on to the next call because that's the call center type uh, uh, management approach. And so and hopefully there'll be opportunities for new um, uh, services and everything to come through that. But it, it, we operate in a very commercial environment and until the incentives are there to do that, they won't, okay? So that's what I mean. And, and I think about, I've, I've had many interactions with uh, energy retailers and I, this is not critical of them. As I'm saying, they're just solving for what their commercial needs are, they, as they should. That's what they're charged to do. They're not there to actually provide a service um, at their expense back to us. Another thing to think about is that we are distrustful of big business and we're distrustful of government uh, generally. And in some of these new approaches and techniques, then it, that, that actually limits us because they're reluctant to actually go and adopt those. We tend to be a lot more trusting of startups or, or, or new digital initiatives. Just think of what people, the fuss and everything that is out there around someone finding out about your energy data because of the personal information that might be there. And think of what people put on Facebook. It, it, it's, it's completely uh, different. We've seen the, the Victorian um, government example when they, they rolled out the, the solar homes uh, project and the implementation. And th there's all sorts of challenges in, in that program, but it's a massive program. So, you know, to try and implement it fast is, is good. The, the facial recognition technology and everything that's in there, which sort of was front page news and everything, it's actually really cool. It worked really well when it worked. <laughs> okay, but it didn't work sort of um, uh, on 20% of the time. We're actually really tolerant of startup companies doing that, but we're not very tolerant of big institutions doing it. And until we become tolerant and reward that behavior, then they're gonna be reluctant to adopt that. There are questions around whether they can adopt it well and everything as well. Um, and then challenges to actually match up those data. So I gave the, um, I said I'd come back to a fairly simple um, example, and this was around councils wanting to know the greenhouse gas um, uh, footprint within their municipalities. And there's a global covenant of mayors that has a global standard uh, reporting for um, uh, greenhouse emissions within a municipality and then what municipalities are doing around that, okay? Because they have policy decisions and everything that impact that. Um, and we were approached by a couple of councils that said, you know, we, we just want to know what is the um, electricity usage by residential, commercial and industrial in our municipal boundary. So not the municipal buildings, 
just within the municipal boundary. And I said, well, that's easy. It's smart meter data. It's all there. So you can just get it as long as you know which houses are in. And you think about councils have the best address lists of any because it's rate payers. We went to the distributors and asked them, why do you, why do you not provide this data? And they said, yeah, we, we do. We provide that data all the time. Anyone ask, we provide it. And then the council say, we've actually given up asking because it just got too hard. And what's happened over the years is that the councils weren't asking the right question. The distributors didn't realise they were all asking basically the same question. They all needed exactly the same data, but they all asked it in a slightly different way. Chances are, when they asked, they asked a different person in the distributor, even if it was from year to year. And we ran a case example through and two data sets came back with exactly the same question, but asked through two different channels and they were 40% different. Now, what it was, the specificity wasn't there on the question, but they, from the distributor's point of view, they had answered that question perfectly. And from the council's point of view, they had useless garbage uh, that was there. And so trying, what we are seeing is that that brokering role is needed of that understanding of the data. For one, can they ask the question in the right way? Two, you have to have a knowledge of how those queries are done in the data sets and everything so you can match up um, as to uh, what is actually, so the, the need and, and the person, that's part of what we're doing. But what was really interesting was that there was, um, uh, so one was the city of Melbourne uh, that we did for, and we spent, we analysed, I think it was eight different, I say we, the, the distributors analysed eight different ways of actually matching up the address list from the council to the meters that are in there. And at the end of the day, the method that had the lowest error was to pull out a map and draw a line and map up the GIS system uh, to the meters that were in it. And yet here we've got all these digital uh, mechanisms that are available to us. And so, it, and that's around the quality of the information that's actually in there and things are getting better and better, but there's still challenges that sit there from a day-to-day -day example. And um, I do, I, I, this is my own personal beef here, a bit of a, <laughs> a challenge where, where we have a lot of digital innovators who are coming in and they're as, as frustrated as um, it can be with the energy companies maybe being not quite as progressive as they should be or, or seeing the opportunities. Um, there's also, there's real challenges in um, digital startups and everything as well, looking for solutions, but with no understanding of the energy market. Um, and we see, I've, I've seen a number of examples, uh, you know, we're a utility like no other. We're all just wirelessly linked, creating a power station in the sky. But of course, there's no power station in the sky. You still actually have to move electrons around, and and, um, and to and to do that efficiently, you need those again those right investment mechanisms. People who are making very very long term investments, they're investing billions of dollars on fifty year asset lives. Um, so I always. It's, not like data, it's actually got a physical connection. But look, uh, so I'll just, I'll finish up here and we'll go into discussion. We're okay on time. We're, um, just, uh, so C4Net, we try to match up with the policy regulators, uh, the companies and with the universities. And it's trying to bring the academic power um, that is there to the companies that often don't integrate uh, oh, sorry, interact as well. And yet they really want to, they're really supportive. And many of these companies are trying to be very, very innovative, um, but they've got to act within their own constraints and whether it's a market constraint or commercial constraint or whatever um, uh, that's there. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, James. Very fascinating. Uh, I think we're all, most of us are probably in the energy space and uh, sometimes we forget we're at the very beginning of this transition and the energy system is going to look a lot different in 20 or 30 years time as to what it is Very today. Well. Walter, are you going to use a microphone this time? Oh, he's brought his own. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, let's pop that down. Thank you. Um, one, one question that often comes is, great, Victoria did that smart meter rollout, we have all the data, et cetera, and what's the consumer benefit? Um, and so far, uh, um, I'm rather ignorant in the field, but I don't know yet of um, 
benefits that consumers on the street could mention in terms of monetary terms other than their information that they have their um, nerds like us who have their information heat maps etc when they are with power shop or something else um, but now with electrical vehicles coming um, that uh, that um, usage case of you just when you park you plug your car in and you don't really care of whether there are two or three hours um, no use so and we have the examples of um, uh, the not so smart just time sensitive uh, the um, hot heat water hot water boiler uh, from 12 o'clock in the mid uh, from midnight to 4 a.m etc and PowerShell, for example, offers that now as well for the electric vehicles, but that is not really smart. That is just time right. of use. Um, so when when are the first technologies rolling out where actually the smart meter data is rolled out so to have one circuit that is switched on, switched off remotely and where you can plug in your um, EV or um, your electrical boiler, etc. When is the first smart application coming out for the masses? So the smart applications are basically there now. So that Tico system that I showed there, that can do everything of what you just said. Like it could actually identify in the market and not just Tico, lots of companies can do it. It's the market rules that are there that are, are the barrier to that. If you like, with the um, uh, Amy data that is there now and going to five minute um, settlements, basically that's all there that you can do. And you can do full disaggregation of your house and you can put the smarts on it as to should you could even um, as in, again, everything is there now to enable this. You could stagger elements in your house so that your toaster waited until your fridge was out of cycle or et cetera. You know, you can do all that and manage your, your peaks and that becomes quite important. You're getting quite advanced, you know, while we don't think of it so much in the house because we don't interact, um, we don't have the price signals. If you get into building management systems or factory energy management systems, they're becoming really quite complex where individual motors will stagger and, and know when to go. So they're managing their demand peak because they do have the price signal of about uh, up to about a third of their, their price will be based on, on that. I can't wait till it happens in, in the household and everything, but it's not so much the component, the, the technology's there. Um, it's really around the market rules now and how we enable people to play uh, within that. Um, in terms of the Amy benefits and those benefits that are there, I, I would argue that the industry hasn't done a great job of selling those benefits and exposing those benefits. But there's actually, there's quite a lot um, that are there. Uh, I took one example with one distributor and... Um, asked uh, a couple of questions and a couple of just uh, points that popped out. So that one distributor had 20,000 points of theft on their network. Now that everyone else, we're, we're all paying for that, right? Because they kind of don't care. They just sit there and go, it's this volume and I divide it up and it's got to be, it's just, a, it's a distribution of costs um, that sits there. 20,000 points on a single distributor of energy theft. Now, I, I label it energy theft, it may be mistakes or whatever, I'm not trying to, uh, but it, it's, un, it, it's where the energy user is not connected to the person who's paying um, the, the bill. Safety wise, um, the benefits of that Amy uh, roller, you've now got some of the distributors and it, it does depend on their system, so it does vary across, um, being highly predictive of um, faults that are in the system and these can be they can start fires and everything to the point that they can automatically either shut down or notify, shut down a house that's, um, or they can see a higher increase in risk and go and um, uh, uh, prevent that. Now, how that plays out in statistics of house fires and everything, that's what I'd really love to see is to, or electrical fault fires and everything. And is it there? Um, but th a lot of those types of benefits all get hidden. Now, whether they justify the uh, investment that went in, I don't want to get into it because I don't know. I haven't analysed it. And I, yeah, don't want to. But what I would say is there's a lot of benefits that actually don't come uh, to the surface on those. 
Uh, just to, sorry, just before, uh, while the microphone's coming to you, something that's um, interesting at the moment is um, there are, in some of the uh, work that's going on in trying to understand the last mile, around Australia, distributors are actually, um, uh, or, or research groups, are actually paying for information to come in um, around the usage on their network. So they're, they're actually buying in some of that information or putting in monitoring. When I speak to them, they'll say, oh, well, if I only had Amy data, I could do this. I'd have it all. I wouldn't need to do that. And it's hundreds of thousands of dollars that's that's being spent um, on monitoring and and um, uh, and also purchasing in data from contested meter providers um, that are out there. We don't have that problem or that challenge here in Victoria. So I'd say it's an opportunity here in Victoria. Sorry. Right. Uh, I'm in Blair. I'm in agriculture. But on the 25th of the 9th, I went to a talk at Melbourne Uni. Uh, on data and democracies, and that was of using both swarm and also normalizing data. And they did LIDAR for uh, PV, uh, traffic management, and also yep. pulling together. Have you talked to Tim Leach? Uh, he's funded by the Victorian government, but they're independent, could help you with all your bringing data together from different networks. Sounds fantastic. Uh, I haven't, and I'll follow up. Right. Yep, so Tim Leach, yeah? Yeah. At, 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 yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Thanks, James. That was a great presentation. Um, just following up on the question about where the barrier sits. Uh, so in markets where you are observing some of these systems being, uh, the TCO or other systems being used, um, what is it about the rules that um, create the incentives? So you would have thought that there are incentives for retailers to try to encourage customers to manage their load um, just to avoid the cost that they would otherwise incur. Um, in peak demand periods. What is it about other markets where you're seeing these systems come forward that we don't have here? Yeah, so um, um, one of the key um, barriers there, or I say barrier, it's, it's a challenge. It's, it's completely over, you can overcome it. Um, you just have to have the willingness to do so. Um, one of those real challenges at the moment is around the, the vertical integration that sits there. So we've got, We've got a separation of retail, wholesale, and, and generation um, market with the distribution and transmission being separate in between. So um, I'll go to how that plays out, but if I come back to where it is actually vertically integrated, have a look what's happening. So Western Australia, for example, um, Horizon, uh, they probably lead the world in microgrid development. Now that's because of the, the need uh, for it, they've got remote towns. It doesn't make sense to connect to um, into a, uh, a another interconnect into another grid. But then you sit there and say, okay, well, how am I going to solve for that? And I'm thinking from everything from generation right through to that customer. I can now put the whole economic analysis around and, and do so. If you take that then into our market, say in in the NEM. Um, uh, I'll give you an example of if I took the most expensive town to serve in, in I, I don't know what that is, but just take that most expensive town. Some of the cost pressures that are coming through on that town uh, would be around um, uh, there's bushfire prevention. So, you, you know, in aftermath of Black Saturday and everything, the, the, um, the costs of maintaining and protecting uh, power lines, swirl lines that go out. If you think of the fires that have been recently over in um, California and having hundreds of thousands, I think they've got to millions of people that they were taking off uh, grid at, at certain times. Uh, that's all around the distribution network. Well, actually, that town, like, if they want to go and invest in, so they access their power from the generation system, but that's a pooled generation system. So for them to go and, in, in, if you were say, but what if I disconnected that town? So if you think of the market structures and everything that sit there now, there's a lot of um, uh, subsidisation that goes to 
to the cost of providing the town, but that's borne by the whole market. Um, but if I look at that town now, what's the incentive to go and invest in generation capacity and everything that's there? You can't because the retail, uh, you, there's rules around retailing at the moment where the retail have to be able to buy from the generation market. Well, they can't the moment you disconnect it. Um, if they go and invest in their own equipment, but then how do they trade to each other? Because the moment it goes out into the network, the, there's the price differential that sits there because it's treated as another electron in, in the system. So you haven't got this ability to go and do microgrids or VPPs in there, but with attacking all the price points across the, the, the whole supply chain uh, that's there. And yet, if you did island it, actually you could say, I, I could optimize both the capital investment that's there, I could probably have it interconnected with another microgrid or with the grid at various times. Um, I could take away the need for, uh, we could tailor the reliability supply that's needed. Because remember, we, we talk about more reliability and everything that's needed, but it has a huge cost to it as well. That's absolutely needed in some spots, but it'd be happily traded off in, in other areas as well. None of those market mechanisms exist um, here now. So does that help illustrate a bit of, of what's there? Yeah. Well, it, it, um, so it, it, for example, if you took a town and then went and put then all, say, Tico uh, type response, you could absolutely, absolutely optimize for the town, but how you divide up the, the, the pool, the value that's created, that's the challenge then that comes out. Or just, it's not so much the challenge, it's, it's what doesn't fit with our existing market structure that's there now. But it's not an easy thing to solve. You know, our market structures exist for a really good reason too. James, um, Roger Dargaville from, from Monash. Um, if a researcher had a interesting project which would require access to the AMI data, what level of, of access to that data is available to researchers and, and what kind of de-identification or yeah. if, if, I, if I needed to know some household, if I, wanted, if I wanted individual household smart meter data at 15 minute resolution, can, can I get access to that? And what, what sort of information uh, so would it look like? In look some like? areas you can. So say, um, obviously Victoria, yeah, at the very least you can get half hour data. Uh, in, in Victoria, some you can get 15 and some you can get five. Soon you'll be able to get five uh, everywhere. It, the, uh, and C4Net can certainly facilitate for you. Just ask for us and we'll uh, go and do that. That's part of that service back to the research community. However, we have to abide by the privacy laws and everything as well. So what we do do is we work on the aggregation. We are looking at how we can streamline some of that the consumer data right um, developments that are coming in are aimed at trying to address um, those issues. They address some of those issues, um, but it, obviously where we have explicitly informed consent from the, the uh, owner of the data, which is the individual, um, that's easy, but that's very, very rarely available. So you said you aggregated, do you aggregate it to the postcode level or? Uh, so it, 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 it depends. Uh, postcode level is certainly aggregated data. So that's, um, you know, I, I don't know, I, I can give examples if you like, the type of request, you know, can I have a thousand random customers? Could I have all the customers on a particular transformer? Could I have something like that? That's the type of thing we can do. It's where you can identify an individual customer or re-identify from, because even when you de-identify it, um, sometimes obfuscation is needed so that it can't be easily re-identified um, back in there. But generally, as long as we can move away from the customer specific details to just have what's their electricity uh, data, that's when we can move into a clearer space. I'll just take a question online if that's okay, yeah. James. So uh, this is Angela Rojas who says, uh, thanks James for an interesting and highly relevant talk. The technology might be here to get users or their smart appliances to participate actively in the market but what could be the implications for the system at the distribution level if every smart appliance is optimised to maximise profit? What could be a good intervention to manage this potential consequence? Um, so, it, it, 
it might be the optimist in me, but I don't see it as a problem. I see it as an opportunity. Uh, like, and, and that's because if you structure it right, actually you can get around a whole lot of the peak challenges because the networks can actually um, put their incentive mechanisms in. They can't at the moment, but as I say, if the market changes, then you can go and do that. Um, where you see that happening a little bit at the moment, where the, the distributors are starting to dabble in it is in demand response. Um, and so that's where they're incentivizing um, various uh, behavior uh, on, the, on the grid. They're not taking control of that. They're, it's an incentive scheme um, and, and very much in a trial level. Um, I'd say demand response is hugely, hugely, hugely underdone in, in Australia. It's a, it's a massive opportunity. But again, we think of there's retail, so there's different value pools and the value pool around the generation doesn't always line up with when the value pool sits there on the network. Sometimes they coincide and sometimes they don't. You think about the, uh, I think you've probably seen the, the bat battery value stack and everything. And it, I think there's 12 or 13 pools of potential value that are there. And the trouble is that you, each person can't go out and have 13 different contracts with, with uh, people. So um, when we can identify a way to do that for distributors, and retailers and how they interact, I think that'll be really good. An area that we are very, uh, you know, where we see a lot of um, potential value, uh, there is on uh, community batteries or shared shared battery assets. So that's a network side um, battery. But the thing is, it's not 100% there for the network. It's there a little bit for the network and some sort of co-investment scheme with, with those who are, um, participate in the benefits of it, that can really change quite a lot. To do so, you have to start thinking very localised markets. So basically a market around a transformer, um, but that can be, again, it's all data. You can you can do it. All, all that data exists today. Okay, look, we're, we're out of time. It's actually uh, 12 o'clock. Uh, so do thank uh, James for coming along and presenting a very interesting uh, seminar. Before we uh, do uh, give a round of applause, I want to mention a couple of other seminars we've got coming up. Tonight, we've got uh, Ross Garneau's book launch, uh, which is over at the Arts West building. That starts at six o'clock. Uh, see our website for the Eventbrite link. Next Tuesday, we have a PhD completion seminar from Alexi Trundle. Uh, Alexi's been looking at uh, climate resilience and adaptation in the, in the Pacific, uh, specifically uh, Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands. Very relevant given uh, Australia's stance towards uh, the Pacific in, in recent months, recent years, in fact. Uh, and then the following Friday, we've got Tom Haller, who's from Stanford, a special international guest who will be, uh, be visiting us and, uh, and giving a seminar on climate finance. So uh, check our website for all the details and all the, uh, all the links. Big round of applause. And thank you to James. Oh, thank you. Thank you.